Contested Bones, Part 15. We've been looking at the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, they have a, a website as well, and some, and some of what we look at comes from that. This is the cover of the book, Contested Bones. And uh, there's Christopher Roop on the left and John Sanford on the right. And uh, the story behind the book, and we're going to be talking about that story today, is that John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50, when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of genetic entropy, or what you might call devolution. And then, uh, after absorbing that, had cognitive dissonance with supposedly all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes. And so, as a good scientist, he went to investigate and uh, enlisted Chris Roop in his help. Chris, I guess, has done most of the actual hunting down stuff. And um, chapter one discusses kind of general things, the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles. Chapter two uh, outlines that the textbook picture following Darwin's expectations is straight line evolution, but the field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like in some state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. This is some people who believe that the ascent of man actually happened. It just cannot be traced. All the fossils are content, almost all the fossils are contested. Chapter three notes that Neanderthals are actually human. Chapter four uh, notes that Homo erectus is human. Chapter five notes that Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, is human. Chapter six notes that Australopithecus afarensis is an ape. Chapter seven notes that Ardipithecus rambidus is an ape. That's RD. Uh, chapter eight notes that Homo habilis is actually not a true animal. It's a mixture of ape and human bones. Chapter 9 says the same for Australopithecus sediba. Chapter 10 notes that Homo naledi is human. And chapter 11 notes that modern humans lived alongside of apes all the way back to 5.7 million years according to conventional dating. Chapter 12 says that conventional dating is flawed. Potassium argon and argon argon dating have trouble identifying recent lava. That is, they have built in age that can be demonstrated uh, much of the time. Uh, and uranium thorium dating has the same kind of problem, both theoretically and also practically. And carbon 14 dating actually argues for a young age for life on Earth. Even when dating methods agree, as we saw last week. They're not really secure. Chapter 13, uh, which we'll go through the first part of, is on genetic evidence. And subtitle, Validation of the Ape to Man Story. And they, they quote uh, Dan Grauer um, saying, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. Now, of course, Dan Grauer uses that in the precise reverse uh, sense. A evolution must be right and therefore ENCODE must be wrong. Uh, it's an interesting to way, a way to argue against uh, data. Um, we're going to come back to that at the end of the chapter. Um, the chapter starts out, does genetic evidence prove what the fossil record has failed to show? This book is primarily about the bones that are claimed to prove the evolutionary transition from ape to man. We've outlined a series of major problems that apply broadly to the hominin fossil record. We've showed evidence that human artifacts and homo bones are routinely found in the same bone beds and since in the same time frame as the earliest presumed precursors. We have further shown that virtually all the important hominin fossils are still fiercely contested within the paleo community. The fossil evidence, while sometimes suggestive, does not bring any type of certainty to the proposition that apes evolved into humans. That's kind of the summary of what we've gotten in the first 
11 chapters. However, most, actually, verse 12. Um, however, most paleoanthropologists, even the ones who openly acknowledge all the problems in their field, remain 100% certain that apes evolved into man. Why is this? We suggest that this is par due partly to the power of the broader evolutionary paradigm and partly to the power of consensus or group thinking. But there are more specific reasons why so many are so certain. It is true that most scientists are committed to the evolutionary framework, yet it is surprising that this strong commitment is not usually based upon the science's own, scientists' own personal experience or expertise. Most scientists need to look at experts in other fields, or even the popular media, to find support for their certainty about human evolution. This can become circular. Scientists are consistently looking to other scientists to justify their personal certainty about human evolution. But there is one field that most boldly claims that it has the real proof of human evolution. That field is not paleoanthropology, but is genetics. For this reason, it is important for us to briefly look at the genetic evidence that bears on the ape to man question. One of us, Sanford, has studied genetics for nearly 40 years, focusing on the topics of human evolution for the last 10 to 15 years. And the other author has been studying genetic questions associated with the origin of man for more than six years. Contrary to popular opinion, the genetic evidence does not support ape to man evolution. In fact, it strongly refutes it. And we're going to go over four profound genetic problems with ape-to-man evolution. Problem number one, creating networks of new biological information. Every form of life is genetically programmed to be what it is and do what it does. This is not a figure of speech. Life is literally programmed. Each form of life has within its genome the programming that makes that living thing alive. The genetic operating system that enables life to be alive is vast and specifies what each living thing is and how it operates. Chimpanzees are genetically programmed to be chimps and human beings are genetically programmed to be humans. The pro program that specifies human being must be incredibly advanced and incredibly specific in order to explain mankind's unique capabilities. The network of executable programs that makes us human cannot be derived by random genetic mutations. Isolated letter changes within an ape genome combined with some kind of reproductive filtering, natural selection. What is required for creating new biological programs is so much more profound than isolated letter changes and random rearrangements of pre-existing genetic code. Random tinkering with an ape genome cannot establish the amazing attributes that make us human. Paleoanthropologists do not generally pay much attention to the question of how new genetic information might arise. They often seem to think that a limited number of beneficial letter changes in an ape genome can result in a few, a few superficial morphologic modifications resulting in human beings. Looking just at the bones, a paleo expert might say that the ape to human transformation is very simple. Just find the ape that stood up. Well, and... Uh, had a bigger brain and had uh, hands that had opposable thumbs. Generally, this is extremely naive. To transform an ape into a human being would require a vast number of biological changes, and each biological change would require large numbers of codependent sets of mutations resulting in new genetic programming. To have the ape to man story work, a large amount of new biological information, extremely specific new instructions, must somehow arise in a very short evolutionary time frame. We're going to go over how short that is. Let's just consider the simplest step, the restructuring of the ape foot into a human foot. This would be an extremely complex genetic undertaking. Many bones, ligaments, muscles, and neurons would have to be reprogrammed, requiring the reworking of many genes. But as we will soon see in the ape-to-man scenario, there's not enough time to significantly rework even a small portion of a single gene. Furthermore, putting human feet onto an ape would by itself accomplish reworking of, uh, I think it should say would not by itself, but that's the way the book reads, um, accomplish reworking of the feet, legs, knees, hips, backbone, neck, and brain. Reworking any one of these traits would require the fixation of many specific mutational events. 
we can show that this is impossible in any length of time and is certainly impossible in just a few million years. See problem three below. Reprogramming an ape so could walk like a man would certainly not result in a human being. To change an ape to a man requires so much more hands uh, hands cap so, so much more. Hands capable of making sophisticated tools, vocal cords, and I think that should be C-O-R-D-S, suitable for high-level verbal communication and special brain structures as required for language. Yet all this is like nothing compared to the programming required for vastly increased brain capacity, enabling conscious thought, and leading to the emergence of the human being. We cannot even guess how much new information would be required to accomplish all this. We can only say that today's best computer scientists cannot accomplish anything comparable. If a host of brilliant scientists and engineers cannot design and implement such high-level programming, how can anyone believe this could arise by a trial and error pr process of mutation and selection? In the cell, biological programming starts with the prescriptive information that is stored within the genome's DNA. Such information is like the dormant program stored on a computer's hard drive. Each gene in the genome can be seen as a separate executable program, which, when activated, becomes an actively running program. The genes within the genome produce a multitude of RNAs and proteins that can be seen as the RAM of the cell. Each cell has millions of actively operating RNA and protein molecules, all of which can be considered active information. Among those millions of information molecules, there's a vast amount of interactive crosstalking. There are encountered information networks within a cell akin to an intracellular internet. For example, those intricate communication networks would include the many signal transduction pathways of the cell. We are only beginning to learn how all these biological information systems are implemented through systems of chemical interaction that involve information, reading, writing, erasing, and signaling. In addition to the well-known genetic systems, there are the epigenetic systems, the epitranscriptomic systems, the glycomic systems, the protein interactomic systems, the phosphoproteomic systems, and the lipidomic systems. There are countless chemical systems that process the many information systems of the cell. In addition to all this, there are doubtless other layers of information waiting to be discovered within the cell. Far above and beyond all this, there are the information networks operating at the whole organism levels, for example, brain and nervous system. We each contain information and information systems, which greatly exceed our comprehension. Where does all this complexity come from? Many scientists are now widely acknowledging that the cell's biological information systems are vastly superior to any existing human information system, according to Bill Gates. And uh, you'll notice that they give a longer version of the usual quote. The last sentence is what you usually see. The understanding of life is a great subject. Biological information is the most important information we can discover because over the next several decades it will revolutionize medicine. And that's the context for human in DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. The nature of biological information has been described in depth in the symposium proceedings, biological information, new perspectives. I see I missed italicizing perspectives. That's mine. Uh, this volume critically examines how such information systems might have arisen. These biological information systems and all the associated prescriptive information content o owing th through them could never arise by trial and error. This is a profound problem with the ape to man story. Neither the Darwinian mutation selection process nor any other naturalistic trial and error process can build information networks containing vast amounts of very specific prescriptive information. It should be obvious that information systems and detailed biological specifications cannot arise spontaneously. Remarkably, there are a few scientists who are still trying to deny that there is genuine information in living systems. They argue that biological information is merely organic chemistry, hence not real information. As if the information in books is just paper and ink and not actual organization. 
The bottom line is simply that the functional information that would be required to change an ape into a human could not arise spontaneously in any amount of time. This is because what is required is the establishment of a vast network of mutually dependent, massively integrated genetic changes. It is foolish to think that Mother Nature could change an ape into a human simply by favoring independently arising random mutations scattered throughout the genome. It would be like trying to develop a new operating system via trial and error, testing random and independently arising binary bit changes. Random mutations in natural selection simply cannot establish the integrated and mutually dependent genetic modifications required to convert an ape into a man. Imagine turning on a computer and seeing, oh, let's just make a few random errors and keep doing that, and if you like what you, what you get, eventually you get all the way from Microsoft Excel into Microsoft Word does not seem likely. While much of the ape and human genomes are similarly programmed, and so are very similar genetically, the genetic differences are still profound. If the human and chimp genomes differed by just 1%, which of course is what we're all hearing, you know, we're 99% chimp, right? Um, this would still represent 30 million letter differences. However, the outdated claim that the genetic differences are just 1% to 2% is incorrect. This misinformation arose in part because of ideological commitment, in part because of simplifying assumptions, and in part because of cherry-picking data, frankly. For example, the early analysis of the, uh, analyses of the genoma, genomic differences only considered single-letter differences and excluded the analysis of those parts of the genome that are most different. If you only look for the almost similar stuff, well, no wonder they're almost similar. Um, when multinucleotide differences, indels, are included in the analysis, and when the whole genome is taken into consideration, it appears that the genomic difference will be closer to 10 percent. And as some of us have seen in the case of the uh, uh, testicles, or, or pardon me, the uh, human MSY, it is more like 30 to maybe 70 percent, depending on how you count it. Um, whether it's 30 million, oh, that's about 300 million letter changes. Whether it's 30 million, 1 percent, or 300 million, 10 percent difference, these letters, these differences must represent a huge amount of human specifying information, as is required to program a human to be a human. In the big picture, the most important differences between the ape and human genomes may not be the nucleotide sequences themselves, but maybe how the genome is expressed, that is, how its programs are executed. We are beginning to see that there are profound ape-human differences that transcend DNA sequences, different nucleosome formation, different 3D DNA structure, different DNA methylation, different transcription, different RNA splicing, different RNA editing, different protein translation, and different protein glycosylation. Problem two, the extreme rarity of truly beneficial mutations. It is widely understood that within the functional part of the genome, most mutations are deleterious, while beneficial mutations are very rare. The famous Lensky LTEE experiment shows that beneficial mutations may be as rare as one in a million. It is thought that beneficial mutations may be so rare that their rarity cannot be accurately measured. The evidence that beneficial mutations are extremely rare is continuing to grow. This indicates that while mutations themselves are common, mutations that are truly beneficial are exceedingly rare. This should be intuitively ob obvious. It is the logical consequence of making random changes in either an instruction manual or computer code. Random changes will consistently degrade useful information and will almost never enhance useful information. The, the exception proves the point. Some homo populations appear to have undergone genetic degeneration due to inbreeding and due to being under perpetual starvation conditions for many generations. This seems to have led to reduced body size and reduced brain volume. See chapter 5. This is called reductive evolution, which is actually evolution going backwards. Devolution, you could call it. 
Although such reductive evolution involves reduced functions and loss of information, such changes can still be beneficial in terms of allowing adaptation to a specific environment. However, mutations that re enable reductive evolution are only beneficial in an artificial and narrow sense. Such mutations routinely result in broken or lost genes, so in the long run, they are deleterious. In a reductive biological situation, a population is put under very special conditions that favor the purging of functional information that is non-essential at the moment. For example, the LTEE of Linsky et al. These loss of function mutations appear to be beneficial because organisms can temporarily grow faster. However, such reductive mutations are actually destroying information and narrowing the organism's ecological range. On closer examination, such mutations consistently represent genetic degeneration. They are actually deleterious and are only beneficial in a superficial and transient sense. Let me give you an illustration of that. Polar bears are better camouflaged because their hair is white. Their hair is white because they have lost the ability to pigment it. That is reductive evolution. And it is very advantageous if you happen to live on ice and snow most of the time and you want to creep around without being seen. Um, it is not, um, it, it is a degeneration though in the final sense. Reductive evolution is also very commonly seen when uh, microorganisms are grown continuously under very uniform and artificial conditions, for example, in a test tube. Under these conditions, loss of genes and functions can temporarily speed up growth. It is deceptive to refer to such reductive mutations as being truly beneficial because what is really happening is not evolution, but de devolution. Problem three, the waiting time problem in a human population, hominin population. Now, so we've covered two problems so far. Uh, the complexity one, the lack of, or the high improbability of beneficial mutations, and now the waiting time. It is widely believed that an ape-like population evolved into modern man over a period of about six million years. And that the evolving population had a, an effective population size of about 10,000 in, individuals. In a relatively small population of this kind, one has to wait a long time if one is waiting for a specific nucleotide to be replaced by a specific alternative nucleotide and for this change to become established or fixed. This waiting time problem appears to be the most fundamental rate limiting factor in terms of what evolution can accomplish. The waiting time problem becomes much worse when two mutations are required to create a specific selective be benefit. When just five mutations are required to reach the functional threshold for a given beneficial trait, the point where natural selection becomes effective, the waiting time becomes entirely prohibitive, exceeding the estimated age of the Earth. That's a long time. Now, unfortunately, I had a uh, figure there, and I think I had to let it go. Numerous authors have shown that this is a profound problem, starting with Michael Behe. John Sanford, co-author of this book, and his collaborators have published research on this problem. That publication has conclusively shown that given a hominin population of 10,000 and given the known human mutation rate and even allowing for extremely large fitness benefits, the fixation of two specific codependent mutations requires over 80 million years. And by the way, that's what the secular literature says now too. This tiny genetic modification gener greatly exceeds the ape to man time scale, 6 million years. Fixing eight specific mutations in a, such a population would require over 18 billion years, greatly exceeding the estimated time since the Big Bang. To put this problem in perspective, eight nucleotides have an information content that is similar to a word such as no or yes. Problem four, and this is the one where uh, Sanford really made his name in I think it's what convinced him. Not only do you have a hard time getting from here to there, but you're trying to swim upstream. 
In addition to the enormous genetic problems listed above, there is another genetic problem that we believe eclipses them all. This problem, and that's a mutation I didn't fix, is the continuous application of deleterious mutations. Contrary to popular understanding, natural selection cannot stop the accumulation of most, of the most, of most harmful mutations. One of the authors of this book has spent m most of the last 15 years focusing on the subject of genetic degeneration. He's arguably one of the world's experts on, the t on this topic. As described above, to transform an ape into a human requires the creation of a large amount of new information, which requires prohibitively large amounts of time. Yet the flip side of this issue reflects an even more profound problem. While waiting for such new biological information to arise, countless deleterious mutations will be continuously accumulating within all lineages. This means that even if a significant number of beneficial mutations were continuously arising and being fixed within a population, a vastly larger number of deleterious mutations would be accumulating. This ensures that there will consistently be a net loss of information. So species such as man or chimpanzee should not evolve, but rather should degenerate. This is consistent with the extinction of the Australopithecines and the degeneration of Neanderthal, Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi. Long, were, that's the next chapter, by the way, long before a specific pair of codependent beneficial mutations could arise and be established, a hominin population should go extinct. Why can't natural se selection filter out all the bad mutations? There are two reasons. One, there are too many bad mutations continuously pouring into the population. And uh, two, most bad mutations are too subtle to be selectively removed. There are too many bad mutations. The human mutation rate is roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation. The eight mutation rate is similar. Almost none of these mu mutations are beneficial. The new ENCODE findings reveal that most of the human genome is functional, hence most random changes in the genome must be deleterious. Even if 90% of the genome is perfectly neutral junk DNA, this is no longer feasible after ENCODE, there would still be about 10 harmful mutations arising in every person in every generation. Even the most fit individuals are still more mutant than their parents, so even intense selection against the less fit cannot stop mutation accumulation. You'd have to kill um, all but one of 20 babies. And the kill rate before birth is something like 25%. That's the spontaneous abortion rate, uh, or miscarriage rate, if you want to put it that way. Um, and so we just don't have the selective power to do that. We just don't. Uh, because most of the deleterious mutations cannot be selected away, they will accumulate continuously from one generation to the next. Even while a population is waiting for its first beneficial mutation, many bad mutations will have already accumulated. Waiting for just one specific beneficial mutation to be fixed in the hominin population requires over 50,000 generations, over one million years. However, in that same time, about five million mutations will accumulate per individual. 50,000 generations times 100 mutations per generation. The large majority of those accumulating mut mutations would be deleterious, and most of these could not be selectively removed because they're not that deleterious. Sort of like having rust on your car. Little tiny piece here, doesn't really matter. But you keep doing that and doing that and doing that and pretty soon you lose fenders and stuff like that. Even if half of all deleterious mutations could be removed, that would still leave 2.5 million deleterious mutations per person. Even if only one-tenth of the genome were functional, this still means 250,000 deleterious mutations per person. Such a heavy genetic load would certainly be lethal, causing extinction of all hominid lineages. This would happen long before the first waited for beneficial fixation could happen. The Nobel laureate Hermann Müller was the first to recognize the problem of bad mutations flowing into a population faster than they could be selected away. 
It calculated that if the human mutation rate were as high as 0.5 per person per generation. Look at that. If it were only 0.5 per person per generation. This mutation rate would ensure continuous genetic degeneration and eventual extinction. Yet the actual mutation rate is roughly 200 times greater than this. Number the two, the problem is natural selection. One, there are too many mutations to select out. But two, most bad mutations are too subtle to be selectively removed. As if this was not bad enough, there's a deeper problem still. The vast majority of mutations are nearly neutral, which means that their harmful biological effect is too subtle to allow selective elimination. The fundament this fundamental problem is well known and led one population geneticist to publish a paper entitled, Why Aren't We Dead a Hundred Times Over? And interestingly, his first solution was uh, that uh, uh, maybe we're not that old and we're headed for extinction. Either of these two well-established problems, too many bad mutations and two, most mutations being too subtle, virtually guarantees that most bad mutations will continuously accumulate within all ape and human lineages. Only the worst deleterious mutations can be selected away. All the rest accumulate like rust on a car. These two profound problems, when combined, are absolutely fatal to the Darwinian premise that mutation and selection can transform an ape population into a human population. In this book, the topic of genetic degeneration has come up repeatedly. It is clear that small, isolated hominin tribes must undergo long-term inbreeding, which will always accelerate gen genetic degeneration. This genetic outcome is certain. Evolutionary paleo experts apply this logic to explain abnormal morphologies in isolated populations of modern man. We have argued that this same mechanism can explain the deviant morphologies of all the aberrant hominin bones that fall within the genus Homo. This includes Erectus, Naledi, and Hobbit. This would mean that the aberrant skulls, commonly referred to as Homo erectus, are simply Homo sapiens that have been genetic to inbred and have thus have become genetically compromised. Now, my take on this particular uh, uh, part of the chapter, we are now within Dr. Sanford's area of acknowledged expertise. To be fair, he is simply saying things that make sense and things that can be and have been verified by others. That is, he doesn't really have any authority of his own, but then that's true of all scientists. They are most authoritative when they are most transparent. Sometimes these ideas have even occurred to others, as in Kondrashov's article, Why Aren't We Dead a Hundred Times Over? The only reason why others haven't reached his conclusion is that they are convinced of the fact of evolution. So, for example, when Dan Grauer made the statement, if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong, his preferred conclusion was that ENCODE can't possibly be right because evolution, in fact, is not wrong. His reasoning for making the statement was perfectly clear. His definition of function, and a common one among biologists, I might add, um, he references it, in fact. Um, uh, one, T originated as a reproduction, a copy of a copy of some prior trait that pr performed F, or some function similar to F in the past, and T exists because of F. And so the definition has, as the first part of it, this is inherited from ancestors. And his view of ENCODE is that that first part is missing. For a trait Q to have a causal function G, it is necessary and sufficient that Q performs G. That is, uh, two holds. And uh, by the way, I'm not just making this up. You can look it up if you want to on the immortality of television sets. And you're going, what does television sets have to do with it? Well, you're going to see it. And I, I love it. Function in the human genome according to the evolution-free gospel of ENCODE. Mm. 
Uh, notice that evolution, specifically natural evolution, is built into his definition A. Thus, Mozart's musical abilities or a peacock's tail feathers are not biologically functional unless they lead to more offspring. Problem is the peahens are documented not to care. You don't have to have that fancy stuff. Well, it helps to have a tail, but, but uh, you don't have to have those beautifully designed eyes on it. Peacocks don't, uh, peahens don't care. Now, Grauer et al. argue, from an evolutionary viewpoint, which of course is theirs, a functional can be assigned to DNA sequence if and only if it is possible to destroy it. All functional entities in the universe can be rendered non-functional by the ravages of time, entropy, mutation, and what have you. Unless a genomic uh, functionality is actively protected by selection, it will accumulate deleterious mutations and will cease to be functional. You see, natural selection has to be there to rescue it. Otherwise, um, the absurd alternative, which unfortunately was, in their opinion, adopted by ENCODE, is to assume that no deleterious mutations can ever occur in regions they have deemed to be functional. Such an assumption is akin to claiming that a television set left on and unattended will still be in working in condition after a million years because no natural events such as rust, erosion, static electricity, and earthquakes can affect it. And now you understand why the t uh, title has television sets in it. Okay. In other words, if you don't have um, a function that can be demonstrated to be selected for, uh, then uh, it, it really isn't a function. Now, for people like Grauer, evolution is a given. A fact, 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 as somebody once put it. Therefore, ENCODE went about things the wrong way. Knockout experiments are the only experiments that count. You take it out, the animal dies, uh, then, then it must be uh, something uh, worth keeping. There's a theoretical difficulty with that, and that is, what if natural selection isn't powerful enough to preserve this thing? That the difference between something with a function and something without the function is so slight that it that by itself it doesn't do anything. But if you do 50 or 100 or 5,000 of them or, or 2 million of them, suddenly the organism doesn't work. Well, you know, how little is too little? And there are practical difficulties with this. One of, these, one of them is, how do we know whether we've done the right knockout experiments? A spare tire on a car is not necessary until you're out in the desert and your tire goes flat. And then it's very necessary. So as long as you only do things on freeways where there's a, a garage every uh, mile or so, um, you never know that uh, spare tires are really necessary. The second one is how sensitive do our experiments have to be as a practical matter? How little damage can you sustain? And again, the illustration of rust comes up. Little rust here doesn't really matter. Little rust there doesn't really matter. You keep doing more and more and more rust, and pretty soon you've lost your fenders. Uh, pretty soon you've uh, eaten holes in the floor of your car. Pretty soon you're having stuff splash inside. Um, pretty soon the stuff that was, uh, you know, water that was being kept nicely out of the engine compartment is now splashing into the engine compartment and shorting out the, the, uh, uh, the electrical system. And now your car won't start. So which was the mutation that killed it? And how do you select that mutation out? But 
That's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Um, this raises the, the interesting question. Uh, you know, if we have 100 mutations that our parents didn't have, uh, and so on, uh, what is the figure? And I, I've never seen an A, and Sanford, I know, has never come up with an exact figure on this, but uh, what proportion of the genome has, I mean, we're degenerating much faster than <laughs> We're generating, I mean, I, if, yeah. one, if one out of a million mutations is good and so on, I mean, I might as well say almost all mutations are detrimental. Uh -huh. uh, how many mutations uh, before we become extinct? Well, uh, it in other words, how. how how rusty does a car have to be before you give it up? I, I, I realize this is a, a difficult question, but uh, man, I wish I knew some figure there uh, that could say, well, uh, you know, we've obviously, you know, we think we, we've existed for 6,000 years. Uh, could we live for 200,000 like the Homo sapiens are supposed to have lived, that's a, that's a restrictive figure, but, uh, and so on. Uh, I, I, I wish we uh, might have some estimate here where, just where that figure is. Well, right now, our estimates would have to be based on information that we don't really have. And part of the problem is that all mutations are not created equal. Uh, there are some mutations that, as far as we know, don't really make any noticeable difference, at least by themselves. There are other mutations that are so damaging that if you get a double dose of them, you're hung. Um, the cystic fibrosis uh, gene, if it's deactivated, by a frame shift mutation that suddenly cuts off a particular enzyme. Uh, suddenly you can't do uh, uh, transport, I think it's of chloride if I remember correctly. And, um, and you wind up being sickly at birth and probably not passing your genes on, partly because you die early and partly because even with optimal medical care, the uh, the sperm don't function properly. I don't know whether the eggs do or not, I, but it makes it, it makes it difficult. And, and your lungs don't work right, and your pancreas doesn't work right, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work right. Now, it, you can ask them interesting questions, actually. Cystic fibrosis is kind of like um, a sickle cell anemia, in a sense. And that is that if you have one of the genes, and you happen to be a European in a country where there's a lot of uh, cholera and uh, going on, you actually survive better because the cholera can't make you have diarrhea quite as fast. And that's probably why cystic fibrosis genes were selected for in Caucasian populations. Uh, sort of like, uh, uh, a sickle cell was selected for in certain black and Mediterranean uh, populations because of the uh, presence of malaria in those areas. So sometimes cutting off one of those nice little gadgets is a way of getting rid of a pathogen that gloms onto it. But in the long run, it's detrimental and if you get a double dose of it, it's definitely detrimental because you wind up not being able to reproduce at all. Um, it's only advantageous where the disease is so prevalent that the likelihood of getting through it uh, makes you, uh, uh, makes up for the fact that you're gonna lose a quarter of your kids. OK. 
could could we guess that if 10% of our genome was mutated, uh, we probably would die? As a, I would die, I should become, humanity would become extinct. Well, I think uh, that Sanford's reasoning, and I think it's sound, is that we don't really know exactly what that number is, but it's probably fair to say that a million years is probably the outside range for a large mammal. So if you have whales surviving for 60 million years, something is wrong here. Uh, if you have humans surviving for 6 million years, you're actually stretching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as an article you quote there a couple of times, uh, says, uh, it says in the article, you know, don't worry, uh, we obviously have survived. <laughs> yeah, well see, that's the thing. Um, if we have survived when we weren't supposed to, what that directly implies is something other than natural selection and random mutations is happening. Something planned is happening, which implies a planner. And once you have a planner coming into it, and this happened before humans, so it's a non-human planner, you have to ask yourself, why would a planner just keep things alive for millions of years when he could have just created the whole thing at once? Yeah, of course, that, that's not where the evolutionists go. Well, <laughs> that, but see, Sanford is following the, the point to its logical conclusion. Yeah. And that's the real point of this whole thing, is that if you follow the genetic argument all the mm -hmm. way out, you come to the conclusion that mm -hmm. short age is the best reasonable possibility because then you don't have to have God continuing to monkey all the way through. You can allow God to do things and then let them run sort of naturally. And why would God create so many animals just to allow them to die off? You know, creation makes so much more sense in certain ways. Well, that's the, and that's what Sanford came to the conclusion of, and that's well, why he's a short age I creationist. Mean, th this summary today, you know, it's just, it's just overwhelming. It's just absolutely overwhelming how, how strong the case for creation is. Yeah, and the interesting thing of it is that that he came to that conclusion. And people who start out with evolution is known to be a fact, 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 can't see it because every time there's evidence against evolution, well, that's evidence that, that our understanding isn't good enough and we really, we need to just throw that out and accept evolution instead. We have a comment back here. Uh, Paul? Uh, so, sort of in, uh, in reply to what you guys were talking about, I mean, would it be possible to, to do like an Ames test uh, and uh, by putting in chemicals to bump up the number of mutations per generation and actually sort of get an estimate of just how, you know, how much it takes to make the population of bacteria go extinct? Actually, that experiment has already been done uh, informally uh, and it's well known that you put radiation in any kind of a, a, a setting and you shorten the age of the creatures involved and you keep doing it for long enough and they go extinct. So can we just measure the mutation rate and there's the answer, at least for bacteria? Well, you probably could. Uh, from an evolutionary point of view, it's not an interesting experiment. <laughs> well, I, we think it's interesting, but that was not actually my question. My, um, my question is simply, could you, um, I, I'm not sure you did this, I, I know you have addressed the ENCODE study before, but could you just, you're using the, uh, referring to the ENCODE study, but could you just summarize what it did? 
Well, the ENCODE study says that uh, at least 80% of the genome in the, in the uh, cells that they were looking at has some identifiable function. It is transcribed or it has to do with uh, DNA winding or it has to do with, there, was, uh, there were about four or five different things that they mentioned that, that, that it actually did an identifiable function. How, how, were they, how were they able to identify a function? Um, that would require a, uh, a, uh, an excursion into ENCODE. We, we did a little bit of that once. Um, maybe uh, at some point we should go back and do it again uh, because, yeah, they had identifiable functions. And, you know, are they all necessary or the cell will die? Well, no, it depends on how you, how carefully you coddle the cell. And of course, if you're doing it in in <coughs> vitro experiments, you're having to coddle the cell pretty, uh, pretty heavily to begin with because cells do better in vivo than they do in vitro. You have to add all kinds of wonderful stuff that you didn't know about. Um, to cells in, uh, you know, in a test tube where you don't have to do that in, uh, uh, in the organism because the organism does it itself. Yes. <laughs> I've been listening to this discussion and reflecting on my past experiences with bright young uh, scientists in training. And uh, when one puts the flood into the picture and the number of organisms coming out of an arc and the necessity to survive in very different conditions that w than were there before, and as they move, as this population moves, genetic diversity is absolutely required for survival. And so we're arguing against the ability of anything to survive following a flood. For, as I've heard you so far, and not you personally, but the, heard the discussion so far, I fully believe in, in creation, but there are just a lot of things that are said that might fit most of the time, but it's the exceptions where they d don't fit that are perhaps most important. I mean, it's a matter of record you know, from very old data. Uh, the transformation of a species within 20 or 30 years due to a mutation. I'm thinking right now of the, uh, the speckled moth in pre-Industrial Revolu Revolution England, which went from a very attractive white, which as a result of the Industrial Revolution made them easy picks for birds because the trees became dark because of all of the uh, accumulation of, of dark substances. And uh, the population went from, uh, from basically white to, bla to black or very dark gray is more. Mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. And uh, industrial melanism. I, I don't want to infer that I, I'm suggesting this makes a short creation, short time since creation, et cetera, impossible. But we have to argue for substantial genetic diversity. In fact, some of the students I've talked with said in terms of natural selection, taking our picture, we become hyper-evolutionists. Because yes, we it, need change so much faster than, than we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, the accumulation of deleterious mutations bothers me a great deal as well. Yeah, I've, I've often said... Uh, I'm not sure what the evidence for that is. Yeah. I, I have often said that, uh, that creationists believe in faster evolution than evolutionists do. No comparison. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, an, an interesting thing that you get, apparently, uh, we're not sure exactly where the boundaries are, but certainly uh, dogs, wolves, and coyotes, and, you know, probably some of the, like, African hunting dogs and dingoes probably are the same general uh, thing, 
came out according to the according to the story they came out as one pair now to be fair also as far as we know those were selected by God not necessarily by Noah um, and therefore he could pack into each uh, pair maximum diversity if you wanted to it would be uh, you're assuming then that there's a great deal of unex unex Press DNA that would be positive in different environments and, yeah. and could become expressed. Yeah. Are, are we then suggesting a divine oversight through all of this and turning things on and off individually? I don't mean uh, to sound skeptical, but these no, are no. problems. I, I, I think very, that, very, very difficult to answer. Uh, you know, the, the, the story that, that Adventists usually believe in is that God actually sent angels to go out and gather the, the animals that he wanted in which case he probably did, those were selected. They were artificially selected. They were divinely selected, if you like. And we invoke this because we have no other explanation. Well, no, we, we, as Adventists, we invoke it because we believe Ellen White had some insights on it. I, um, I understand that, and I, uh, I don't and, want to be misunderstood. And I, and I think that if you read the Genesis account carefully, um, it's not in opposition to that, that uh, mechanism. That, they, that Noah was not responsible for getting every kind of every animal. That, it, that he was responsible for housing them but not for their selection. Paul? But then again, those animals had to have a great deal of genetic diversity. They did. Stored but unexpressed. Yeah. Or perhaps expressed in such a way that they looked like mutts. Yes. You know. And, uh, at some point in these discussions, I and my colleagues walked right into the jaws of T-Rex. Yeah. Uh, Paul, just to insert to what he's saying, uh, we do have an example of very rapid evolution, and that is the the human selection of dogs. To, to we got extreme variation right now, and that that's done over a period of a few hundred years. Sure. I, I know, I know. But the point of it is that uh, selection could happen fairly rapidly. Right. Uh, and exactly. for example, uh, I think for polar bears. Uh, the selection happened uh, probably about the same time as their coats turned white, basically. And, and, and I don't even think that it was natural selection where you have to kill off the polar bears. I think this is an important point. And that is, if, if supposing you're an albino bear, and you go to hunt woodchucks and they all duck before you can get there. You go to hunt seals and you can kill them easily. Well, where are you going to find your next meal? You're going to go where the food is, right? So that it would not, you would not have to kill off all of the uh, polar bears that didn't, you know, all, you, all you'd have to do is allow them to eat where they could, and you could actually, you know, preserve both, both bears. Of course, it's too bad for the woodchucks and seals, but presumably they're multiplying faster. And the seals got a head start because they don't have to be. So you're saying by migration that they simply created different species. Yeah. Interesting. That, yeah, migration could create different species easily. Uh, stuff that is happy where it is stays where it is. Stuff that uh, finds uh, slim pickings goes on and finds better pickings somewhere else. Yes. Okay, I'm convinced. Patterns do not create themselves. In fact, when you make observations, they have a tendency to degrade. Yes. Now, when you look at this, and this happens in the universe, where is sin? I'm, I'm not saying this to be difficult I'm just trying to find an explanation here because we we look at Adam taking the fruit or no, um, Eve taking the fruit 
Sin came into the earth, and some people say into the universe. Well, it was there before, I guess. Are we saying that when she took the fruit that the whole laws of physics have changed? Unfortunately, there were no modern scientists there to do experiments to find out whether the laws of physics changed. Maybe that's Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at where we are right now. We've got this truth that patterns do not form themselves. That means God put it together. Right. And we assume that God had put us together to live forever. That's certainly so the way it's stated. So how would, how would physics support that? Physics or chemistry? Well, it makes no difference. Wow. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, physics, chemistry, biology, you know, uh, yeah. The, but the tree of life was essential. The tree of life seems tree, to have been the tree essential. Of life certainly is, uh, taking uh, out the tree of life seems in the story to have made some kind of major difference. For the in, whole universe, though? <sighs> or is the tree of life some sort of healing thing that we had to yeah. have all the time yeah. to keep uh, us alive? But then you ask, ask the question, do all the animals have to take from the tree of life so there would be no death? I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, and uh, we're dealing with, um, how shall I say it, uh, we're, we have inadequate information to be able to, to uh, definitively answer that question. And I think the only thing that you really can do is to, one, accept the general outlines, which I think is important. And then two, to the make hypotheses, outline? some of which will be testable and some of which will not. And the testable ones, I think we should test. And, you know, if they fail the test, then we have to move on and do something better. If they su su succeed, then we put a little more confidence in them. I uh, would comment right here. In the uh, new earth, the tree of life, the leaves, are for the healing of the nations. It should seem perfectly rational that God has a chemical in the leaves of those trees that resets our genetic system. How it will work, don't ask me that. But I mean, it definitely hints that something has to be put into the people saved in the new world for them to continue living. It so does, why not in the first Garden of Eden? It does sound like we don't have uh, unconditional immortality in the, in the new earth. It does sound like we're supposed to come back to the tree of life every once in a while and uh, get a little extra. Um, uh, maybe it has some kind of super uh, human specific telomerase or something like that. I don't know. Um, it does also suggest, though, that in the new earth, not only will there not be death, but there will not be people trying to murder because I would think that one could still murder if one wanted to. And the protection against that seems to be that God will not take people who will want to murder. Mm. So there is a sense in which I, even our immortality is not going to be sa on the same par as God's. He's got it, period. We're going to wind up having to recharge every once in a while, apparently. At least that's the way I read the Tree of Life story. Um, and that means that to a certain extent, some of the same physics is going to be available to us, I think. Uh, but obviously with a, with a twist because we don't have a tree of life right now. If, if it were, were that easy, we could have made our own tree of life. By the way, uh, before we get too much further, I'm going to say uh, if, if they're redoing a second uh, edition, they should put in a little sequence of one of the problems that we have is brand new enzymes. Um, 
the, what they call the uh, orphan genes in humans. There's no explanation for that from an evolutionary standpoint. They come out of nowhere. And we, uh, we don't know what they all do, um, but the idea that, that you can have you know, a fully functioning uh, protein coding area uh, that just is for humans alone and not for monkeys or chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans or anything like that, this is pretty, uh, pretty difficult to figure out how you could get that happen by uh, random mutations alone, even if you don't count genetic entropy. And once you count genetic entropy, uh, it, it becomes hopeless. So a little bit like getting a water strider. Water strider will take forever to get across a lake. Okay. Uh, a long time. But it's worse when a water strider's on a river. And the river is flowing downhill, and you're trying to say, well, how'd the rod strider get uphill? Well, it didn't. It, it had to have been put there by something else. Anyway, comment here. And okay. uh, <coughs> My observation, candid observation of the discussion the last 12 minutes or so reveals to all of us something we already know is how little we know when it comes to reconstructing the past. And when we have God and his handiwork in the picture, as soon as you bring in that element, you know, what was the tree of life composed of? What was the fruit composed of? What will it be in the heavenly kingdom? You know, it, it's, fun, it's fun for us as humans to speculate and try and think God's thoughts after us. And, I think that's what God wants us to do, but it also shows how little we know. Now, back to Sanford. Um, he's made the claim that uh, we need about 10,000 years or so, plus or minus, for accounting for the human genome the way it is once it started with a perfect set of genes, and accounting for the rates of mutation I wonder if he, the revised edition of his book is going to deal with the flood as a genetic bottleneck. We've, Jack, we've alluded to that. And once you have a genetic bottleneck, unless you say all of the genetic information was carried through that bottleneck of all the ancestors of Noah carried through, um, it just destroys your equations. You know, you can't use Sanford's equations with the flood. So now you're down to explaining it in a tighter frame, and that's 4,500 years. Maybe throw in some other genetic changes. Uh, skin color is a big issue and all kinds of things. So that's one although, thing. Although some of that could have come through at the wives of the... Uh, yeah, the I've heard scientists. that argument, but uh, again, that's 100% pure speculation. Sure. <laughs> um, that's one thing I have uh, concern about Sanford. The other is he's talking about a precision that a physicist would also talk about with radioactive decay. Now the difference with genetic mutations and radioactive decay, one basic difference is you can actually see through instrumentation with a hadron collider or any of these giant accelerators, you can see the moment when there's breaking up of the atom and, so to speak, decay. You can actually uh, see the results immediately. Whereas when we're talking about mutations, it's kind of a black hole, at least in my mind, when I look at through the eyes of physics. You know, where, at what point did the mutation happen? unless you have a complete log of all of the genetics of all the humans that have ever lived, then you could see at what point. But the information is so sporadic, and when we do Neanderthal DNA, we're talking about only one or two percent of the whole genome, you know, just with Neanderthal being able to re 
reconstruct it. So the window we're looking at possible decay is so tiny, it's a tiny little crack. And I'm, personally, I'm a bit uncomfortable with it, mainly because I've never had a class in genetics, but I've had quite a bit of training in physics, and I'm a little more comfortable with something you can see versus what you cannot see. Anyway, interested in anyone's reaction or your reaction on that. Just a personal observation. I, I mean, I would, I would agree with you that, uh, that we need to acknowledge our areas of ignorance uh, far more than we do. And that um, uh, I mean, there are a few things that we, we think we know, some of which I think will stand the test of time, a few of which will not. Um, you know, this happened in medicine. Uh, uh, you know, I would have to smile if I think about how we taught advanced cardiac life support in 1980. The basic ideas uh, are mostly still there, but the, the drugs and protocols we use are entirely different. Um, uh, not entirely different, but, uh, but substantially different, let's put it that way. Um, and you know, who knows whether our understanding of the basic science of biology isn't somewhat the same way. Um, and one of the things that's coming out now, we just know a whole lot more about uh, uh, genetics in terms of the actual sequence than we used to. And one of the things that I think is revealing is the more you know, the more you realize uh, that that the basic underlying mechanism that was proposed um, by Darwin to begin with is inadequate for the job that it's got. And I think that once you realize that, then uh, it, it, ha it has a sea change effect. And if you're somebody who's not fighting, I don't want to say if you're somebody who is religious. I think that it isn't a matter of having to be religious. It's a matter of simply not fighting the religious uh, implications of the data. That it jumps out at you. And that it's really hard to resist. And John Sanford decided that at some point he wasn't going to resist it. Um. Just a PS to what I just here. said, real quick. I'm not suggesting that uh, the science of physics is more reliable in reconstructing the past, because it has big time problems as well. Well, actually, to be fair, the evolutionary biologists know that they're, as they put it, at the bottom of the totem pole. <laughs> yes. And then we'll come back to you. Oh, me? Yeah. I'm fine with mystery. You know, our starting point is we're created. And we're created beings studying ourselves. And we all know that uh, that's not a very good way to arrive at uh, truth about who we are. So maybe the best way we have, or the second best way, one of them being simply listen to the guy who did it. But yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and we're, we're lucky because that guy did speak. <laughs> and we know. So mystery's fine, but I still like, all, the more I listen to everyone here, I'm John Q. Adventist. You know, I'm not deep into the sciences. And the more people talk, the more I realize uh, the devil has a thousand rabbits we could go chasing. Yeah. Oh. No, no, down to it. Uh, oh, and one other, uh, several people have mentioned uh, evolution as going from one type of animal and becoming another species. And my understanding is oh, we don't do that. There's kinds, and in those kinds there's a vast amount of difference because God uh, planted that for, uh, for his pleasure to see what happens in creation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, am I right in assuming that? We're not talking about going from one species into another. 
Well, it, yeah, it, it depends on how you define species. If you define species in a, the, the most natural sense, that is, that can, which can interbreed with its own kind, then polar bears are not a species. And then you're talking about, even though we call them species in the official uh, biological world, uh, they're not really a different species because they can crossbreed with Alaskan brown bears, for example, who can crossbreed with grizzly bears, which can, you know. <coughs> and so when you, get, when you get right down to it, no, they're not different species uh, in that sense. In which case, um, what you're seeing is still variation within a species. But if you want to be really technical, they're officially different Linnaean species. Uh, Linnaeus, towards the end of his life, started asking questions about whether he'd drawn the lines too tightly because he started seeing things like horses and zebras uh, as possibly part of the same species. So. That's one, of the, that's one d discussion that needs to be made. Is there such a thing as a biblical kind? And, is there, and are there boundaries to it? And if the answer to those two questions is yes, then that has some biological <laughs> meaning. Uh, we are not to where we have really asked all those questions yet. And eventually we need to get there. Yes, and then uh, Jack. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. Um, yes. Yeah, I, um, interesting discussion here. Uh, I'd like to uh, us focus on the broader picture, uh, and that is uh, the overwhelming data that uh, Sanford has presented here on the other side of the picture. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Our knowledge is so imperfect, it's a lot of fun to speculate about various things. But look at the weight of the solid evidence, folks. Look at the weight of the solid evidence. There's no question that the creation uh, model seems more rational than, than people going down this evolutionary route and then in the context of this data, uh, this is rather overwhelming in favor of creation. Okay, back and then uh, Jack and then uh, third. Yeah, if, if Ellen White has some insight, um, I mean, she said specifically in Patriarchs and Prophets that um, uh, it was Adam and Eve's, uh, one of their activities was this, you know, it was a classroom in which they were to study the universe. And she specifically says that the laws of nature were open to them just as they are to us today, implying that the laws of physics hadn't changed according to her, her perspective. And we know and, and that- And this is before the, the uh, advent yeah. of sin. So yeah. it appears that at least most of the laws, if not all of them, were the same as we have now. Yeah, but we can, we can use physics also to look back in time um, realistically because we can study for example the fine structure constant which is made up of nine individual physical parameters that have no predefined reason for what they are and at least that we know of at least that we know of but we can go back in time and we can measure that fine structure constant back to galaxies 10 billion years ago and see that it hasn't changed so uh, it includes the speed of light the charge of the electron those kind of things uh, evidently um, there's no evidence for the laws of change, physics changing in any time in the past. And we can, I mean, this is something we can measure directly. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that our first assumption should be that they haven't changed. I think that's the rational first assumption. You, I agree. You can challenge it if you want to, but you're going to have to have some evidence before you, before you trash it, I think. And I'm not sure we're anywhere close to there yet. Well, <clears throat> these questions are all, pardon me, that's too general. We're asking some questions for which the answers, if you're going to find them within the range of natural process, are very, very difficult to integrate with our belief. Uh, 
species just as a simple one. There are very clear evidence, uh, not evidence, metrics for a species subdividing due to the group moving into different environments. And over a relatively short period of time, enough genetic change occurs so that if they spread and come back together, they can no longer reproduce with each other. Uh, yeah. So, so the ability to reproduce is not something you can force onto the uh, the term kind, for example, or any of this this sort of thing, because there are just too too many examples that can clearly be shown. I, I don't pretend to have the answers, and I yeah. uh, like all of you. I'm personally totally committed to creation. And uh, there are just some questions I don't think we'll ever answer until we talk to the designer. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And the other thing is that there are things like ring species where um, you, have, uh, you have variety A that can crossbreed with variety B, that can crossbreed with variety C, that can crossbreed with variety D, E, F, and G. Exactly. And when you get to H, H and A are living together, but they can't crossbreed with each other. Well, that's a that's a typical scenario for <laughs> for the spread of species that they so, will subdivide. Incidentally, the Eng English sparrow was introduced into the U.S. I think in the late 1800s as a single species. There are now over 30 different races, some of which are reproductively isolated from each other. Um, and that just happened within the last uh, 200 years or so. 120, 130 years yeah. at the longest. So, in other words, we can't find concrete answers that to take the, the and I'm not, I'm not disparaging in any way the term kind, but it's kind of hard, pardon the, the oxymoron here, but it's kind of yes. hard to uh, force onto uh, these mechanisms, uh, any particular criterion. Well, the, the, to me, this is one of the things that, it, that is exciting about doing, you know, Y chromosome studies is sure. we might be able to reconstruct some of this stuff. Sure. And, it, and if we're lucky, we'll find, um, you know, ice dog somewhere, um, uh, parallel to ice man. You know where you can go back however many thousand years and and uh, and and see what what came close to the original and we might be able to uh, test some of our theories in that way. Um, uh, I think that that more information is better, and if we're right, and I think we are, then more information should. You know, perhaps in in some cases educate us somewhat, but uh, they should fall within certain ranges. And so, you know, I'd like to know, for example, are foxes really dogs? And maybe we can answer that question. And how, what criteria would you use to answer it? That's the whole problem. Well, uh, let's put it this way: Let's uh, supposing that we were able to find wolves and coyotes in red wolves. And they're pretty, pretty securely part of the same original population, and dogs, and we're able to show that their Y chromosomes converge. Um, and then we were able to show that, let's say, African hunting dogs converged with them, and so did dingoes. Um, and you'd have to do this in a. Uh, in a present day determination because if you if you use evolutionary scales to try to to try to answer these questions you may wind up with uh, different answers but if you use empirical evidence presumably uh, that that's by the way what happened with the uh, human mitochondria so they used an evolutionary constant mm -hmm. and it was 20 it was 200,000 years for mitochondrial eve and then when they used modern data, they found out that it was only about 6,500 years or so. Sure. Which, of course, nobody believes. But, well, uh, 
I, I think from all sides, more information is yeah. more likely to complicate the and, answer. And then if we found out that foxes converged at the same time, you could say, well, foxes are part of that same family. On the other hand, if foxes don't converge, then you could say, well, there's a dog pair and a fox pair. A uh, dog slash wolf slash coyote pair. Um, and it, it would be interesting to see how many of these families we could converge and especially using the non uh, crossover stuff because the, with the non crossover stuff you have only mutations or I suppose deliberate divine mutations or deliberate mnemonic ones I don't know how many of those ones there are uh, but I doubt too many uh, and so I see this as a, you know, an exciting time for us to be able to take that kind of information and, and start not just using it destructively against the other guys, but actually using it constructively for our own, our own purposes. Uh, That's where science gets exciting. Actually, my doctoral work was at fish behavior. And thinking about these at that time, since I'd come right out of college and into a much more uh, challenging environment, um, I began to ask myself, where were the aquaria on the ark? Well, the, the standard answer is there weren't any. Exactly. So there's a whole group of organisms that were not subject to the, the high, yes. highly selective process. Yes. And yet, in some ways, they continue to be more diverse, more successful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, it, that, to me, it's always gotten more complicated as you get more information. And uh, fortunately, personally, my faith has not wavered from that. But my understanding of those who have more difficulty with these topics than I do has grown dramatically. Yeah, and I think that's good for us in general. I, I think it's always a mistake when you when you look dumbfounded as how could you be so stupid? Um, well, understanding we, why people think the way they do even if they differ with you and are therefore presumably wrong, oh, uh, <laughs> I, I think is uh, well, I think is always uh, well, helpful. I mean I'm saying even if they're wrong. Well, thank you for that lead in. Uh, when I finished my degree and immediately moved into Adventist higher education, I started getting invitations to go out to church groups, et cetera. And I quit accepting them. Simply because I could not answer questions that they rightfully uh, asked in a clear cut, it couldn't be this way. In other words, if, if I found, at least in my own approach, if I tried to then explain some of the uh, issues based in life sciences and these physical sciences, such that it made the answers much more complicated, um, that too many of them began to think I was other than who I am. And so I quit doing it because I found that personally, at least for my approach, if people know me, I can do a, a great deal more interaction than if they don't. And I, I think these are issues that the whole church doesn't need to deal with, frankly. Uh, I, th I think it's probably better, I mean, those of us who are into it need, need to stay into it and working, but uh, it, it takes a long time to bring someone who isn't uh, doesn't have a background to the point to understand uh, where where we're coming from. Yeah, I do think though that there is a uh, there is a very important point. Uh, there, there's an important um, there's an important role for people who do that kind of work because. One of the, the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all for the witness to uh, all nations, and the fact of the matter is we've tended to leave leave out uh, secular humanists in Europe and North America, and I think that's that's a tragic blindside, and it's contributed among other things to um, 
the shriveling up of the church, the, 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 um, the church in, in, in Europe and, and North America. Uh, we're just not, we're not hitting that area. Uh, and that's not to say that we shouldn't be hitting the other areas and maybe, you know. Uh, you mentioned Europe. I lived in the Tendon Church again in Germany for two years. I mean, the, yeah, the church. The questions have really placed restrictions on, on uh, attracting those who are asking the difficult questions. Yeah, uh, I mean, we do need we do need to you know be preaching in in uh, you know in India, in uh, Africa, in South America, Central America. Uh, we're actually doing pretty well there, and by the way, that's true for Protestants in general. Uh, those places are opening up, uh, but somehow. <laughs> You know, in in what's supposed to be the homeland, and the, the you know we we've, we've kind of lost some of it, and I think one of the things we have to do is we have to pay attention to the faith science I issue because it's not going to go away on its own. Yeah, that, that's kind of exactly where I was going to follow up with our friend here. Is you know, in my daily life as an engineer dealing with geology all the time those things are just kind of there. And so for me, you know, this class and then this kind of information is important in my life because, you know, otherwise I'm stuck with just the standard geological input and you, you wouldn't, you know, then if you only had your belief and then the standard science and you didn't have this backing up your belief, then you'd be stuck with either you know a binary choice without all the information. Yeah, you, and so it's important. Have, you either have to be schizophrenic yeah. or you have to go one way or you have to just completely ignore all of the knowledge that you get from your geology and your, your yeah. engineering and geology stuff. But for somebody else whose daily life doesn't have that in it, and it's not a part of who they are as far as, you know, their work and everything else, then other things, you know, may be more spiritually important. And this, they can take on the basic faith and that people who are studying the science have, you know, okay, studied it and some, you know, there's some beliefs there. So, uh, one of the other things I was going to mention was that um, Revelation at the very end is very clear about what you receive at salvation. There are two grants you receive. One, the right to live in the city, and two, the right to eat from the tree of life. So I would take that to mean that without that right to eat from the tree of life, your DNA or whatever is gonna continue to break down, that somehow that process must, must be essential to continuing forward. And then the other question I guess I would ask is, at the beginning, he talked about these other information systems that were in the body that were all just protease, lipase, and, and everything else that were in there. Would it be possible, because these are all feedback mechanisms to each other and through back to the DNA, that mutations could occur in these other informational systems that would then feed back to a change in the DNA? I think we know little enough about the system as to not be able to answer that question definitively. Um, there are interesting uh, DNA repair mechanism defects that happen, one of them being Fragile X syndrome. Uh, where the DNA doesn't repair itself and therefore you have more and more mutations um, leading to, among other things, mental uh, deficiencies that weren't there to begin with but that happen because the DNA doesn't repair itself properly. So, yeah, if you, if you don't, 
if you don't have the basic repair mechanisms, you can really, uh, uh, it can really do a number on your DNA. Yeah, because I mean, they were talking about function being, you know, assigned to the DNA, but what I wasn't clear on was how those functions transferred between the systems and then those systems all <laughs> loop back to each other. Well, they do loop back to each other, but we don't understand exactly how. And, uh, uh, you know, we know that, they, that there is some looping because if you change one, you change the whole thing. Uh, but, uh, like I say, we're not at the position where we can say exactly how they all work. Um, and it's one of those things you just have to kind of accept what we do know and, and, and try, to, uh, try to understand the rest. In the meantime, try to allow, um, allow for our lack of knowledge when we go describing the system. So really to get back to Dr. Rolfe's original question, the first question he asked about, you know, how many mutations would it take to go extinct? The, ex the answer is we don't really that know. Into the, the other systems, it yeah. could be even less number of mutations required to, to hit the point where the yeah, system doesn't function. Yeah, maybe if you, if you disrupt the epigenomic material, then suddenly uh, uh, stuff in the genome that could have been survived otherwise is no longer survivable. It is interesting to watch the fertility rate in uh, uh, the Western world going south on us. Uh, some of that, I'm sure, is due to abortion. Some of that is due to um, probably lifestyle stuff. But some of that may be just simply degeneration, and we're actually watching it in front of our eyes. Uh, my understanding is that now in the United States, we're starting to dip cl pretty close to two. <laughs> 